Our seventh line of evidence for evolution involves artificial selection as opposed to natural selection. Artificial selection um, is the term used for human-controlled survival and reproduction. So, for example, selective breeding. And the repeated use of selective breeding has created some very large changes in some domesticated organisms, right? Here's the, the rock dove that's the ancestor of these kind of fancy pigeon breeds, right? This one you can barely see its head, this one has a big tail, this one has a big puffed up chest. These were our domesticated breeds of pigeons that were bred by um, British hobbyists. You can see how different they are than their ancestor, than how they started. And in fact, if you read Darwin's book, his famous book Origin Species, one of the very first things he talks about is kind of how the fact that we're able to do this is demonstration of kind of the ability that organisms have within them to change when selection is imposed. Now normally nature is imposing the selection when we're thinking about evolution, but when we do the selection, we can see some changes as well. So here's my favorite example. So if we look at modern domesticated dogs, like these um, pathetic things here, um, they're descended from, not modern wolves, but wolves thousands of years ago that became domesticated. And it's a big change, right? You can see the, like, the look of disdain here, like this is a ridiculous animal that nevertheless evolved from this, but via the use of artificial selection. And maybe chosen to be more convenient carrying purses or something like that. Here's a kind of more technical example. So this is uh, the results of selection for heavier and lighter mice. So there's a guy called Faulkner in 1953. What he did is he took a bunch of mice, um, weighed them, and when they were at six weeks, and he took the heavier ones and mated them with each other, and then each generation he weighed them and took the heaviest ones and mated them, and over time they got heavier. And he took the lightest ones and mated them with each other, and then the next generation he weighed them all and took the lightest ones and mated them with each other, and over generation by generation they got lighter. And so in fact in only 10 generations, so that's not long, he got mice that started off at 21 grams to get all the way down to 14 grams. That's a 33% decrease in weight. This would be equivalent to, say, starting off with humans that are on average 6 feet, and in 10 generations we could get humans on average down to 4 feet. So it doesn't take long, just 10 generations, of artificial selection to cause huge changes in organisms. Now we don't expect natural selection to be as efficient, right? It's not as consistent, there's more randomness involved, but there's also a lot more than 10 generations over Earth's history for natural selection to cause things to change. So the power of this line of evidence, this artificial selection, is when we impose selection that we understand and control, we see huge changes which is consistent with the idea that when nature imposes selection that is nevertheless genuine, even if it's less efficient, we would still expect to see very large changes, especially with the much longer timescales. Now one point about this that's interesting is this initial selection, when Faulkner started here, right, he had heavy mice that he mated and then lighter mice that he mated. The only reason this was able to work is because there was variation, right? Not all the mice were exactly the same. So this selection that he did required variation. Here's an experiment that I undertook a few years ago. This was prior to me coming to Cal State Long Beach. We did an experiment. We took pictures of the wings of Drosophila fruit flies, and we selected for some of them to have wider spaces between these two long veins here, and some to have more narrow. And these guys we selected for this cross vein to be closer to the edge of the wing, these guys we selected for this cross vein to be closer to the body of the fly. They started off the same. We selected two to decrease. And this is an average typical fly from generation 29. We selected two different lines to increase. This is an average typical fly from generation 29 here. And you can visually see the difference between the wings of these flies in a selection experiment that actually only took us about one year to perform. So it doesn't take much in terms of time to cause visible changes between organisms, and um, lots of things have variation that you can select on. So we can look at this in more detail. So selection requires variation. The selection must choose individuals that are different from the others, and those differences have to be heritable, right? If the offspring don't resemble the parents, selection on parents is not going to be effective. And this can be best illustrated with something called the breeder's equation. This is used in agriculture, hence the name breeders. This term here, the response that you get 
It's the change in the overall mean from, of the trait from one generation to the next. The response is going to be equal to the narrow sense heritability, so that's a measurement of how much offspring resemble their parents, goes from zero, where there's no relationship between parents and their offspring, and one, where there's a perfect relationship between parents and their offspring with no noise. So this thing is varying between zero and one. And then this is multiplied by the selection differential, that's the difference in the mean of the trait between the ones that are selected and those in the overall population. So the bigger the difference between the ones you select and everybody, you get a larger number here, and that's combined with how heritable the trait is. Those two together tell you how much of a change you expect in the overall population in the next generation. You can diagram it like this. We have a big group here, call this group number one. We take some of them, call this group number two, just mate them to make the next generation, call this group number three. The response is the difference between the mean of everybody here and the mean of everybody here. So the response is the mean of group three minus the mean of group one, and that includes these guys, right? They're part of this overall group. So the change between everybody here compared to everybody here is the response. The selection differential is the difference between the mean of everybody here compared to the mean of everything here, including themselves, right? And so that's the selection differential, and then the response is the heritability times the selection differential. How much of a change do you expect for the overall population from there to there depends on the difference in these guys and everybody, and the degree of heritability of that trait that you're selecting for. And what are the limits of heritability and variation? Like, is everything capable of being selected? There's a famous experiment done by Weber in 92. He again uh, looked at fly wings and he chose four little positions in fly wings, like the most inconsequential small part of a fly wing. Can't see this with the naked eye, you need a microscope. And when he selected on this, he was able to change the positions of these four parts of the wing. And in fact, in general, when we do selection experiments, almost everything varies and almost everything varies in a heritable way, when we do selection, we change these traits. We get responses for basically almost everything we ever try to do this with. The only exception is something called directional asymmetry. That's a very strange sort of trait. But basically, everything else that we do an experiment like this, where we do artificial selection, we are able to change it. And that means that, first of all, it can evolve when we choose to make it evolve. And second, that basically means that everything in nature that could influence survival and be selected on is a target of selection. So the fact that lots of things evolve over time is not a surprise because when we do experiments we see that almost everything we pick can evolve over time. So let's revisit this breeder's equation a little bit again. So the response is the heritability times the selection differential. The heritability is also the slope of the regression equation in the mean offspring trait versus parents. So if you have sets of parents here and you calculate the mean of the parents, and then on this side you looked at their offspring and calculated the mean of their offspring, and you made this figure, you'd get data points here, right? Smaller parents have smaller offspring on average, larger parents have larger offspring on average. The slope of that line between those data points is also the heritability, same heritability as this. And so if you had a, a very clear relationship between parents being bigger, having bigger offspring, you'd get, say, heritability 0.7 versus something more intermediate that's like a sh more shallow relationship, or versus something like this where there's no relationship between the parents and the offspring. This would illustrate a heritability of zero. If there's a heritability of zero, there's a zero there, no matter how much selection you did, you would not get a response, right? You keep selecting these large parents here, the offspring will keep being the same, and that kind of makes sense, right? So without heritability, where if heritability is zero, no amount of selection can cause a response. So only traits that are heritable can evolve. The second part of that breeder's equation is the selection differential. That's the difference in the mean of the trait between those selected and those in the overall population. So imagine you have six individuals here spread out from one to three. The average is about two. If we selected the biggest two here, say their average is about 2.8, the selection differential would be 2.8 minus 2 is 0.8. So you would get a larger response than if, say, the population was less variable. If you selected, again, the two biggest individuals, but now their mean is maybe only 
2.5 minus 2 is 0.5. You, get, you would expect less of a response. And then if there was no variation, if everybody was exactly the same, then any two you select, 2 minus 2 is 0, 0 in there would give you no response. So without variability, the selection differential would be 0, and no amount of heritability would allow a response. Both heritability and um, variation, which allows a selection differential, are required to get this response. Given this, a higher heritability means more response given a certain amount of selection. The bigger this is, the more the response. Second, more variation allows you to have a bigger selection differential and gets you a larger potential response. And so this actually, this Breeders' equation is useful because it highlights the three things required to get a response. The variation, the heredity of that variation, and the selection that we impose.